Many cities have a Chinatown or a Little Italy, but the bustling diversity of Ontario's capital city means an even richer mosaic, one that includes North America's largest outdoor South Asian market. It's known as the Girard India Bazaar. It's a vital part of the city's fabric and the subject of a new documentary, Little India, Village of Dreams, that will have its world broadcast premiere on TVO on Saturday night. Here to tell us more, Nina Beveridge. She is the producer and director of the documentary. Samaya Shah, henna artist at Forever Beauty Salon and Spa. Gulshan Alibai, owner of the popular restaurant Lahore Tikka House. Chandan Singh, who works with his parents at Chandan Fashion. And Kanweljit Karana, proprietor of Kala Kendar, one of the oldest businesses in the Gerard India Bazaar. And I'm delighted to welcome the filmmaker and all of the protagonists of this wonderful documentary, which I've seen and is great congratulations, to our table here at TVO. I want to just give our audience a chance to find out a little bit about you. So let's go around the table here and just start by telling us, Chandan, where do you work? How long you work there? What do you do? Sure. Um, I work with my family business here at Chandan Fashion. Um, I've been working there five years full time now. I started out part time as anyone who knows with the family business. You sort of uh, work there as a kid at growing up and you sort of watch your parents uh, interact with customers, seeing what they do, sales etc. And um, the last five years I've been there full-time after doing my honors in marketing and I just sort of been trying to take it to the next level. And what is it exactly that you're in the business of doing? Oh well we own a sari and a bridal boutique so we own if you're basically South Asian or you're marrying someone South Asian or you want to wear something South Asian for the fun of it you would come to our store in Little India and we would um, get you all dressed and suited up the day of. And your stuff I gotta say is absolutely spectacular. Thank you. It's really really gorgeous. Thank you. We put a lot of pride in um, the things that we offer and uh, either myself or my mom or my dad will all take turns and we'll personally go to India and procure all the items. Not very much as this sort of um, auto selected. We all have our little flavor of what we carry in, into our items. I, and ten times more selection than anybody else in the business. I, I would say I so, yeah. No, I know. Well, that's what you said <laughs> in the documentary. So, you know what? I, I'd normally say, let's talk afterwards about fixing me up in something. But Anybody? I don't know. I'm just kind of like suit and tie. Hey, you'd be and... surprised about the things that are available out there. We've got some really nice Indo Western there. Okay, uh, we'll talk. There. Yeah. We'll talk. Okay. Uh, Gulshan, let's talk about what you do and for how long you've done it and where it is. So, my husband opened up Lahore Ticket House in 1996. And so I started out as his first cashier, his waitress, and sometimes even helping him, um, you know, make the food in the back. And, um, I was also um, moonlighting there as, as I also worked as a social worker at the Canadian Mental Health Association for about 20 years. And then um, suddenly he passed away about three and a half years ago, so I had to come in full time and put up my sleeves and be the boss. So it's uh, been about three and a half years where I've been there full time. And where is the place exactly? The place is at 1365 Gerard Street East. It's a beautiful orange building. You can't miss it. And you've got kids who are Yes. More or less interested in the business, right? Yes, I have a 16-year-old and a 12-year-old um, that sometimes come and help me at the restaurant. And they're saying, Mom, you can't sell it because one day we want to take it over. Now, they're saying that now. Do you really think that's going to be the case? Um, it really, really depends on how well they do in university and how they, if they get a job or not. So, you know, it kind of, it's going to depend on that, I guess. But, yeah, right now, one of um, Adam's friends came to eat at the restaurant, Ben, and he said, I think you should franchise this place. So <laughs> I think he's got some ideas happening now. Good. Okay. Samaya, tell us about what you do. So I've uh, grown up on Gerard Street. We lived on Gerard for almost 15 years. Um, my mom had a salon um, and spa. It's called Forever Young now. It used to be called uh, Rose Beauty Salon at one point. Um, and uh, I learned aesthetics. I learned henna. Um, I don't do uh, that there at the location anymore because I got married and moved to Mississauga. But I do have my own business, uh, my ha own henna business that uh, I operate by myself in I've Mississauga. I've seen you do it in the day. You're really talented. Thank it's you. It's great. Now, but you're not demonstrating any of it today. Oh, look at my, uh, my oh. hands are always stained like this. <laughs> <laughs> I was just doing a bride this morning, actually, and uh, I, I don't get to see my hands empty like during the summer. Uh, months because there's so many weddings going on, so many bridal appointments. When you do your most elaborate work that goes, you know, not to up the arm and up the everything, how long does that take? It can take up to eight hours if that is, if it's really that elaborate. The, the, the most I've done, has, it was eight hours. How, how'd you learn how to do it? Uh, it's self-taught, so I just I used to just doodle on my leg and my on my hand on my brother's leg sometimes, <laughs> and I just learned uh, by doodling and uh, creating stuff. Terrific. 
Okay. Kanwelji, you ready to go here? Yes. I'm okay. Ahead. Tell us about your business, how long you've been there, how long you've been the king. I, I'm the CEO of Kala Kinder, and I came to this country in 1976 after having the complete uh, knowledge of the fabric and textile from my father, which had a company in Japan from 1946. So when I came to Gerard Street to join my parent company, which is Rokosari, though the Kala Kinder is the sister company, and uh, I find that it's getting very hard to come the area which is kind of uh, not handling properly. So we started that uh, Kalakin every day, kind of a group over there to make it Kalakin there, as well as the Gerard India Bazaar a success. And fortunately, due to the help of the uh, city of Toronto and the police department, we made that Gerard India Bazaar one of the best in North America. Amen to that. Uh, Kalakender, does that translate to something in English? Uh, uh, yeah, it's an art centre, actually. Art centre. Okay. Art centre. And you're from where originally? From originally, I was born in a different country, which is Indonesia. Then after the education in India, I went to Japan to join my father, which was in 1962. He had a very successful export company. And family involved in your business as well? Uh, at that time, we was, uh, the whole family was in Japan, and we were doing the export to all over the world. Somewhere in 1970s, 80 or something like that, uh, 76, the Japan was not getting a little bit uh, better for us, so we tried to move to North America. And first have you got picked, your family members involved now? Uh, yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. We first we wanted to go to America, but somehow we said we prefer to go to Canada. Good choice. And we opened a two wholesale department, one in Vancouver, one in Toronto. Gotcha. Okay. As people look at a wide shot of this set and they see Nina Beveridge making a movie about all of this South Asian wondrousness, they may be wondering, what's wrong with this picture? But in fact, you're born in India, aren't you? I was, yes. Do you think that planted the seed for your interest in this documentary? Oh, 100%. Um, I have great affection for the culture, and uh, though I only lived in India for about five years, I went back between to do a bit of high school and university and traveling. Mm -hmm. My parents had a long-time relationship with the country. They made films there. They did educational projects there. And there were many um, Indians in the home. We ate Indian food and did a lot of traveling back and forth. So um, it really is part of my, you know, in my heart. And when uh, TVO had a tender to do a sort of a Canada 150 film that reflected on diversity and Canadian identity, I looked at, you know, the bazaar, which is two blocks from my home, and said, I have to do this story. So that was going to be my next question. You, you obviously had the background. You wanted to tell a story, but this is really very close to home for you, isn't it? It's quite selfish because uh, <laughs> it's been... I, I loved it. I really loved the project. I loved the opportunity to sort of reconnect with the culture, to make new friends, and to really delve into the neighbourhood because, you know, I've lived there for 20 years bringing up kids, and you don't really have the opportunity when you're working and, you know, bringing up your children to sort of go out and you know, explore all the cafes and shops and stuff. But um, so this was an opportunity to really dive in and, and, and get deep and meet people. And I, I have to say it took a little bit of time to build trust. Uh, but, you know, we got there and I've met some amazing people and characters in the film and it's been really Let good. Let me ask you one follow up on that because you've, you've tried not to have all of your protagonists be from the same place in South Asia or having the same characteristics or the same backgrounds or the same businesses, that kind of thing, you've picked quite a lot of diversity within a region of the world. How and why did you do that? Well, it was just, it was very intentional. I have to say I wanted to tell a story about a Muslim woman. I think in this time of kind of Islamophobia, et cetera, et cetera, it was really important. This was an opportunity to tell a, a real story, a positive story about, you know, a typical Canadian. Muslim who's doing her thing. And Sumaya was amazing. She completely got it. I said, you know, just represent yourself. And uh, so I, had, I wanted to do that. And then um, Lahore Tika House and Gulshan, you know, all these characters here, they're, they're all gifts as far as I'm <laughs> concerned. Lahore Tika House is a, is a sort of foundation uh, of the bazaar. It's known far and wide. You know, uh, people say they get off the plane from London, England or New York or they drive up from Detroit, and the first thing they do is they go to the restaurant. So that was a place that we sort of, you know, we had to 
we had to explore. And uh, uh, Kanwaljit Purana, um, I was very interested in him because he is very much a part of the fabric of the bazaar and how it evolved. And he brought a lot of, I think, sort of enlightened principle to how the BIA was formed and how a very diverse group of people who had a lot of politics from back home came together, worked hard. Their focus was on the future and, uh, you know, in their new home. And so, you know, I really wanted to include his family. <laughs> and then Chandan Fashion with the blue and pink building and <laughs> Chandan, I mean, all these places, once you walk in the door and you meet these people, you know, they, they have to be in the film. Um, now, another very important aspect of it was uh, we wanted to focus on the next generation. So the children who either came here very young or were born in Canada. And so their parents came as the immigrants and sort mm -hmm. of bore the burden of, you know, adapting to the new home and launching the businesses. We were focusing on the children and how have they taken it forward. Gotcha. Uh, I want to ask you a very politically incorrect question here. You ready for this? <laughs> yes, I am. The film chronicles a group of people who are all quite successful in their respective businesses. And I want to know whether there is something, do you believe there is something in the South Asian culture that produces entrepreneurship or great business people? Well, what's really interesting is um, I was born in Africa and Uganda, and we came in here in 72 as uh, refugees during Idi Amin's time. I don't know if you remember that. Of course. Um, my Great, great, my great grandfather came from Gujarat, and there were entrepreneurs there, and they brought that same blood to Africa. My grandfather had the first master dealership in Uganda, hmm. and um, my on my mom's side, they had the first furniture store. So I think it is in the blood coming there, and it's also economic survival, as well. Just you know, you have to learn how to do business um, to survive, and they brought that with them from India to Africa, and then. They brought it to Canada, and I know my husband, Ulner, um, his family the same. They all came from very entrepreneur families from India, then to Africa, and then to England. And then he brought that to Canada because he, um, you know, he was an entrepreneur in every right, and I think he learned it from his forefathers. Hmm. Chandan, I think you told the filmmaker here to my left that you were, quote, unquote, where it is here, a pure entrepreneur. Yeah. So is there something to the... To the notion behind my question? For sure. Uh, it follows up to uh, what we were discussing is, you know, from a from a early early child, I remember seeing my parents grinding, hustling, doing what they can to survive. And um, as much as entrepreneurship is in our blood, it's also, for a moment of time, it was our only option. You know, coming to Canada uneducated and the traditional means of being educated, it's either you work for someone else or you work for yourself. Um, and then being third generation in this business, I think it's always was the only option for me to work for myself. Um, so I remember as a kid, I would you know, buy a box of chocolate bars from the grocery store on Gerard Street from BJ's, and uh, I would buy the box for 20 bucks, and I would go to school at lunchtime, I would sell the chocolate bars for $2 each. And I would come home you know, with 20, 30 bucks at the end of the day, and that would just accumulate day after day, and then I'd move on to, to, to bracelets I would get from the Chinese store down the street, or um, you know, whatever I could get my hands on, just try to flip and sell. And nobody uh, it was necessarily in... taught you how to do that. No, you no, just learned no. by example. And, and, and in fact, my parents would find out, they're like, what are you doing wasting your time doing this? You should be in school studying, right? <laughs> but it was in my blood. It was just something I had to do. It just was in my DNA. And you've already told us that your father's generation was involved yeah, my, in the business. My forefather, even my grandfather, started the business in Indonesia. Hmm. So it goes and back many generations with you as yes, well. Yes, so far is the fourth one. Okay, so Maya, like Chandan, you have a gift for this. You've told us about that already. Uh, your business history down at the bazaar, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, uh, so my mom opened uh, a Rose Beauty Salon uh, almost 15, 12, 14 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, she got uh, chronically sick, and uh, I was in my third and fourth year of uh, uh, full-time university. And uh, that's when I had to kind of take over completely over the business uh, for her. How old were you at the time? I was 19. <laughs> 19 years old. I uh, had a. I was really inspired by a hammam spa that's um, in downtown. So I opened my salon uh, name. It was called I Henna. So let so. me just follow this now. You're not only taking care of the business your mother started, you're starting your own as well. I'm taking over the business that she started, but I completely changed it. And you've changed it, yes. okay. Yes, I All renovated right. the whole spot. Um, I uh, changed the staff. I had almost 
13 employees, 13 to 14 employees at that time. Uh, I did a whole Groupon deal and we sold like 20, 25,000 um, Groupons. And uh, to be quite honest, at that time, like I, I felt like I bit more than I could chew. So, and this was all during like full-time studies. So um, that taught me a lesson, big lesson. And I did end up closing the business down at that time because I couldn't keep up with the service. Uh, things were falling apart. And so uh, I closed that and then my mom reopened <laughs> uh, just down the street. She reopened another spot just a year from then because she got better. Uh, and so she opened Forever Young, which is right across from La Hortica House. And she took you back in. She took me back. <laughs> well, no, at this time, I was at this point, I was married. So I had moved away, but I did help her establish it again. I started off again. So. Uh, I, do, I do on and off go there to help her out, but uh, most of my henna business, actually, my bridal business does come from uh, that salon. So you're, you're, you're a parent, you are helping your mother with her business, and henna. you have started another one? Yes, I have started another business, which is a decor business. Uh, so we do event decors uh, for weddings, mostly. Also in the bazaar? Not in the bazaar. Oh. Uh, this is uh, Mississauga-based. That's in Mississauga. Yes. So when do you sleep exactly? <laughs> I've been slept for four years. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Okay. Let's let's just hone in on the name here for a second. The Gerard India Bazaar kind of implies that there's one culture at play here. But in fact, let me ask the filmmaker, how many different cultures would you see if one were to go down there? Well, it's generally described as a South Asian uh, bazaar with but the you know the sort of Indian moniker is prominent maybe because they arrived first. Mm -hmm. But um, it's, I'd say, Indo-Pakistani. And keep in mind that within India, you know, there's 29 states and oh, other territories. Sri and they, as well? And, well, also Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. Bangladesh, mm -hmm. Nepal, even there's, I think, a Tibetan business. And um, so basically from that region of South Asia. Um, and, but even the Indian stores are all quite different from south to north, uh, east to west. There's, there's quite a bit of diversity. Well, this is what I want to get at. Chandan, I want to find out whether or not the six all shop at the sick owned businesses, whether the Pakistani population all shops at the Pakistani run businesses, the Sri Lankans at the Sri, et cetera, et cetera. Is that how it works? Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Especially not, I mean, it's hard for me to speak for other businesses, but especially for our own. Um, the, the offering that we carry, it's so, it's so diverse amongst um, different cultures. So um, a sari that we carry someone from a different culture could definitely wear it. But specifically, what my dad was, was doing at, at a time, we, well, he was talking to his customers and saying, hey, you know, what do you usually wear at your wedding? And then Ismaili people would come and say, you know, we wear white saris. But traditionally in Punjabi or Hindus, you would never wear white on your wedding day. So he would listen to his customers and be like, all right, what are you looking for exactly? He would sort of cater to them, start caring what they were, what they were looking for, and then you would see more and more and more different types of diverse, diverse uh, ethnic mm -hmm. communities coming in. That raises another question for me, which is, Kanweljeet, I want to ask you, the part of the world that you originally came from can be a very troubled part of the world from time to time. And yet it seems like, you correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like most of the different ethnic groups that inhabit the bazaar get along pretty well. Is that the case? Yeah, the event when it started before, there was hardly Pakistani and Indian only. And uh, I know there's uh, about 10 members only. It was getting harder and harder. On one side, there was some racial problem over there. The second, and we was not getting along together. But when we had some problem, I said, listen, you guys are uh, interesting me as uh, the head of the association. Period. Keep it in mind, we are in business. We are not a politician. So whosoever wants to be, become a politician, write it down on the out of his store. I'm a politician, so that the customer won't go. Somehow they agree. And the first thing we started with the local residents, the, there were so many problems, the parking, especially when there's a movie system, there was no video system, there was a big rush, and the, all the movie go, they park wherever they want, and the local resident was cr uh, crying on that. So we approached the city, uh, the police department, Somehow, unfortunately, they didn't help us. Then we went to the city of Toronto. Somehow, they didn't help us. Then I said, listen, uh, we guys are, uh, I had to show that we are proud. We are educated people. Either you have to do something, otherwise we're going to take it. 
We are not going to raise the fist because we don't like that way. So either let's sit together, work out on that. Fortunately, things started working. Beginning, there was one association, Indo-Pak Trader Association, because we were hardly Pakistani and Indian. Then uh, the Sri Lankan started coming and all that, and we had a good connection with the city of Toronto and police. So let's make it BIA. And, A and business that, improvement area. Um, yeah, business mm -hmm. improvement area. Let me go to Gulshan with a little follow-up here. Is it your impression that the problems from back on the other side of the world have or have not made their way into the bazaar here in Toronto? Well, what's interesting for me, it's, it's interesting because often people think um, Muslims are, are all the same, it's, um, you know, in terms of um, how they believe, but Muslims are very, very diverse. Um, and me being an Ismaili Muslim, which is a sect of the Muslims, often I have other Muslims coming into the restaurant saying, are you halal? Right, because I come from a sect that is a lot more liberal. So I see that um, more than I do in the microcosm of, um, of Little India. So for example, Chandan and I probably have more in common um, because you know we've both been raised here. So we have our values and our ethics and that might be more in common than I would have somebody who's come um, from India or Pakistan like three or four years ago. So that's kind of what I see in terms of differences. Um, old and new. Let me ask Nina then, how well, in your impression, the rest of the community has embraced the whole South Asian phenomenon on Girard Street? Uh, if, if you're talking about the residents as well? Yeah. Or, um, I think in general, the, it, is, it is a unique area and it has been documented as such in sort of academic studies that um, the Girard India Bazaar formed basically in a kind of I'd say Caucasian European kind of neighborhood. So the surrounds are not necessarily South Asian. There's a few, of course. And when everyone moved in, they moved in over their stores. But it is a bit different that way. However, that said, in general today, uh, I'd say the residents love the bazaar. They complain about, you know, if there's noise. I mean, sometimes there's, you know, bump ups in terms of belief systems about you know, on Independence Day for either India or Pakistan, you know, too many people hooting and hollering or whatever. But that's typical grumpy residents and probably an aspect of being near the beach, you know, and they're very active residents. And would you agree with the observation that in the main, people have put their old world politics behind them and are looking for something different here? I would say 100%. And that's one of the things that was, I've, I found very inspiring about this film. And, and, you know, it is, I think, a very Canadian story of endeavor where, pe where people came here from all over. They shared, you know, they came to the bazaar because they, had, they shared a common language or a few common languages mm -hmm. and common culture to sort of bolster themselves and, and adapt to this new world. And in general, they've, you know, collectively prospered and done very well. Not everyone has, of course, and that's part of the aspect of the changing mm. bazaar today. Let's show a clip from your movie, shall we? Sure. Okay. This, uh, Kamalji, you'll like this one because this is of your son, Mickey. Definitely. This is um, <laughs> Mickey establishing a music department in your store uh, on the floor, I guess, where you previously used to live. I think that was, that yes. was part of the living space there. So, okay, Sheldon, let's roll this clip, and then we'll come back and chat. <laughs> I grew up in the late 70s, early 80s, so uh, let's just say Indians were not as welcomed as they are today. There wasn't a day that went by in public school that I got into a fight over my turban or my hair and I came home with my hair open. That made me stronger. In high school, someone casually said to me, you're older now, why do you need a turban? Why don't you cut your hair? then it wouldn't make sense for all those years that I fought to keep my hair. I'm only keeping and paying faith in my religion because of what I went through as a child. Chandan, let's hit this on the head. How common was racism in the neighborhood in your experience? It was there. It was there. Um, I, I remember telling the story to Nina earlier about uh, sometimes I would just go play in the, in the playground that was behind the bazaar. There was a, it was a school attached directly behind the bazaar. It was Rodin Public School. And I remember going there with two of my buddies, um, Mr. Gunan Mutani's kids. Uh, we would go down there and we would just hang around the playground. And I remember this one tall, very, very tall for when I, when I was that little uh, African-American kid came up to me and just started picking on me, um, just saying, why are you wearing that towel on your head? 
and he literally started beating me up. And I looked to my friends, and they both dashed. They ran. They ran as fast as they could, and I was like, these guys left me over here, right? To get my ass kicked. Um, so uh, next thing I know, I see a mob of 15 South Asians coming, running to that part, to that park. It was my dad, the neighbor, the neighbor's kids, people I didn't even recognize. And they all ran up and they all were like, hey, what are you doing? And they grabbed this kid by the collar and said, if you ever mess with one of our kids here again, you will not hear the end of it. And that sort of was like the, the, the nutshell of what it was like growing up. You know, you get picked down, but then you would also get that support from the community as well, which, you know, was really important. What year did that happen? That was probably mid-90s. Mid-90s, so tw at least 20 years ago. Yeah. Today, different? Today's different, yeah. I mean, today's different. I mean, I feel like the kids nowadays have it so easy. I mean, it's in the sense where um, people who have turbans, people who have different articles of faith are so included. And uh, there's a lot of um, education and knowledge spread about um, people of different faiths nowadays in the schooling system um, and in different ethnic groups as well. You look at Brampton and it's like, you know, you, you, kids raised, getting raised up there, everybody around them looks like them. When I was being raised, I was the one and only Sikh turban in my school um, from all the way from grade junior kindergarten all the way to grade 12. It was a great school, Bayview Glen, but um, even then, I still would get picked on. Even though it was a private school, it, it didn't mean things were safe. People are still see you as different. Probably taught you some resilience, though, that of kind course. of thing? Of course, yeah, it definitely toughens you up. There's some things that still stay with you, even now, 15, 20 years later, but um, it definitely toughens you up and, and puts a thick skin on your, on you. Well, speaking of toughening up, Gulshan, I want to ask you about the time when your husband, may he rest in peace, ran the restaurant for years with a loyal staff, and then he dies, and now you have to take it over. And I wonder what that was like for you to try to walk in those shoes. Very, very difficult. Because not only was I just dealing with the grief of his loss, and also trying to help my kids with the loss of their father, which was very difficult, but coming into a business where they didn't want me there. The, the staff, staff didn't want, want me there. Why not? Because um, for a lot of reasons, one, boss was boss. Boss ran it a very different way. And now they call me Bobby, which means brothers, um, brother's wife, so Bobby ran it a very different way because I was more or less brought up here. So I was very systematic, it was very black and white, you know, yes, we're friends, but you're also, you know, an employer and there's expectations. And so I ran it very different from how um, boss ran it, Ulner. And so they didn't really like, you know, the piece that I was coming in. And, and also being a woman, I think that made a huge difference. I was when, just going to ask you that. What, yeah. A male leader versus a female leader? Yes. You saw a difference? Huge. Because I remember when I used to watch Alner manage the restaurant, I mean, he would say something and everybody would just listen. And when I came in and I would say something, it, was, it wasn't taken the same. I felt like they just didn't take me seriously, and I had to work 10 times harder to get the same task done than, than Elner did. There is a joke about that, you know. Yes, what so is For that? women to get ahead, they have to work 10 times harder, more effectively, and more efficiently than men. Fortunately, that's not that hard to do. <laughs> that's the joke. Anyway. I think you are right, because um, I, I saw my strength, definitely, and you know, through this process. But also, um, I found that, yes, we can multitask. And, and that's one thing I was able to do you know, with raising two boys and, and running the restaurant. But the gender issues was something that really shocked me. I mean, yeah, I know I, I, I'm a social worker. I know there's gender issues, but I actually had to like face it. When did you take over the restaurant? Um, I took over the restaurant. He passed away October, um, sorry, November 6, 2013. And I had to take the restaurant over November 7, 2013. So it's almost, you know, it's almost four years later. Yes. Are you accepted now as the new person in charge? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I was talking to a friend of mine, and I'm going, you know, I went through the whole grieving process, not only with Ulner, but I went through the grieving process with Lahore Ticket House. First, I couldn't accept the fact. I hated being there. You know, it was a huge struggle. I went through every process of the grieving process with the restaurant. And now, finally, I think I'm at, OK, you know what? I'm going to accept it. I'm not going to have everyone love the restaurant or love the food. But it's OK, as long as I'm doing the best and giving the best. So I'm at that acceptance stage, finally. Hmm. And I know your older son says, we are not letting this restaurant go, because that's, A, that's, that's his connection to his dad, and maybe his future in business as well, right? I think you're so right. I think, I think also one of the biggest things that I had to do is I had to keep owner's memory alive. And it was the restaurant that was my only vehicle to make my mm -hmm. sons know that 
you know, Abba is still there. That's what mm -hmm. they call their father. And you're right, they feel like his memory is there and his legacy is there. Nina, I think it's time to take another look at another clip from your documentary. Shall we hear? And this one's on you. Okay, let's see Chandan fashion at work. Sheldon, roll it, please. My father is as traditional as can be as an Indian merchant. He's learned from his father back in India, so I'm actually third generation uh, in this Indian bridal business. He's taken his ideologies and put them here in Toronto and, uh, and basically done things the way his dad did, did things back home in India. It's all very old school. If you never learn something, then I'm never successful here, okay? He's my father. He's a blessing. He teach me like that. I am a first-generation Canadian, born and raised in Toronto. I do understand a lot of people looking for business being conducted a certain way. Dad, what do you think? Thumbs up back there for the group. Do we have a thumbs up? She's wondering if, you, if it's giving you the wealth factor or not. We got four thumbs up over here. <laughs> okay, two things. Number one, was I right about how gorgeous the stuff is there? My goodness, fantastic. Number two, is that leaf clock for sale? Uh, that's his prized possession. Oh that's my a gosh! Hardcore that's leaf the one. That, I mean, the, the, okay, fashion I know nothing about, but that leaf clock I know something about. Cool, that's yeah. what I want. Uh, you say in the piece, he, you know, your dad's old school, and you probably Super got some new school. ideas. So how are you going to resolve all that? Oh, we, um, we, I am, I'm always presenting new ideas, and we're constantly butting heads. But that's just sort of what makes a family business a family business. You know, um, sometimes we're like, hey, dad, we got to do this, we got to do that, and I'll argue with them for three months until I can finally prove my point. Or uh, sometimes just sort of go for it, just do it. Um, but yeah, it, it's always a challenge. And is he giving you the license to branch out a bit, do new things? You know, I'm super fortunate that I have the support of my parents. No matter what, at the end of the day, they're so supportive. They know that I'm the new generation. They know that my generation is the one that's sort of buying now and mm -hmm. not his anymore. So they understand that. They're, 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 very, they're very intellectual about that. Um, so they do give me the full support. But at the same time, I'm also, you know, going back and forth with them. Like, uh, for example, I hired a new, um, a new cachet, uh, and her name is Megan. Um, she's not Indian, she's Caucasian. Um, but I wanted the business to sort of be run a certain way. So as soon as I hired her, I knew that he wouldn't say no. Because our cash register, it's almost like a sacred place for us. It's where we do our morning prayers, it's where we um, say thanks for everything we get. At nighttime, you close it up, you say thanks for everything, we, we, all the business today. Even if you didn't get much, you're still very grateful and thankful. Um, you, you do your incense by there, you have pictures of your God around there. So when I knew that was going to happen, I didn't even ask them. I just asked her to come in on Monday, and she's there on Monday. And my mom and dad are looking like, who is this girl? Why is she here? <laughs> um, so literally the next day, my mom and dad both sat me down over, over, over lunch, and they gave me an hour lecture about what they were doing. And something I've learned is that you know, the more resistance you get, the more closest you are to success, the more, the more opportunity you have to grow. So I'm listening, listening, I'm like, maybe they're right. Maybe I shouldn't be you know, messing with their karma or their chi vibe over here, you know? Um, but then I was like, you know what? No, this, this feels a lot of resistance. I know I'm going the right way. So I have a question. Is Megan still there? Megan's still there. Yeah. And she's become like the unofficial new daughter of Tendon Fashion. <laughs> so like they love her there. But it's also thanks to um, all the new things we're doing. We're renovating. A good friend of mine has helped me renovate. Um, we, we've done the third floor now. We're working to the second, the first. So it's this new culture we're bringing in. Um, without that new direction, you know, it, there wouldn't be much room for growth. Gotcha. Uh, so Maya, I want to ask you, you told us about you and your mother and the business background there. You have a younger sister? Yes. She is now being brought into the business? Uh, kind of, yes. Kind of? No, yeah. How's that working out? Three <laughs> strong-willed personalities trying to figure all this out? Uh, she's a bit of a rebellious child. She does, she's a tomboy. She has her own thing. She loves dance. She's not into aesthetics. She's not into the salon business. She wants to be a police officer. Mm. Um, and you'll see her little part in the documentary where she really opens up about her um, upbringing and about how many like uh, struggles she had, she faced because she was diagnosed with um, juvenile arthritis, mm. um, and I, I guess it kind of gave her a leeway too, in a way, because my parents never pressured her. They never had kind of the expectations that, that they had with me, so um, I I don't see her uh, kind of you know, uh, being in the same footsteps um, as okay. my parents. Let me follow up with Kolwaja. We've got one minute left here for me to ask you this question. Do you hope, I mean, the business started with your grandfather and then your father and now you and now your son. You want your grandchildren involved in the business? Uh, 
Yes or no? To be very frank, the Kosovo ever got the established already, maybe having a chance to go for the grandchildren, but whosoever is a little bit uh, hanky-panky on that, in that case, will be not that easy. But hopefully, the, so far, whosoever is uh, going the third generation or fourth generation, I wish them the fourth and fifth generation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nina, let me give you the last word. Uh, there's not only the film that's obviously on tomorrow night, but you've got a website as well. What will people find at the website? Well, on July 1st, in tandem with the premiere of the film, we'll be releasing... Saturday night, I should say. Saturday night's the film. Saturday night. Saturday night, yes. July yes. 1st. Um, we'll be releasing over 20 uh, web documentaries, which are short portraits about other business entrepreneurs in the bazaar. I wanted the exercise, uh, this project, to be very inclusive of everyone in the bazaar. And um, so they're very heartwarming personal portraits that explore similar issues to the film. That sounds awesome. Uh, congratulations on getting it done. It's really a terrific, Thank you. Uh, one of the nice things about working here, you get to see the documentaries before they actually show up on television. <laughs> so I've seen it and it's great. Congratulations. And thanks to all of you for coming in today and sharing right. some of your Thank stories you. with us. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. You can find out more about the film as well and the, uh, the people rather featured in it on the film's website. As just indicated, that's villageofdreams.ca, villageofdreams.ca. And of course, you can watch the world broadcast premiere of Nina's documentary, Little India, Village of Dreams. It's on Saturday night, 9 p.m., TVO, and streaming on the web at tvo.org slash documentaries. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.